Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. I know everyone is anxious to know if they answered the quiz questions right on the matching quiz on Friday. I've put together some notes and a little video to accompany those notes on D2L immediately following Friday's lecture if you want to see some thoughts on design specifications. There are also some videos, if you haven't found them or didn't know they existed, on how to inverse Laplace transform with complex roots and real roots using your calculator if you have an 89. The th same material, I think, should be pretty easily applied to the TI Inspire, and I've allowed or put those links under Unit 3 on D2L. Homework four, you have probably enough information to process that or to do it, but I'm going to go ahead and delay that a couple of days, so that's due on Friday, homework number four. I need to, that hasn't happened yet on D2L. I don't have access to D2L today, but hopefully I will later in the day. But since you came to class, that's your insight into homework number four. You'll get more insight in the first part of today's class. I'm going to try to help us figure out the terminology or the phrasing in homework number four, some of the problems. It's maybe not clear, and I don't want you to spend time trying to decipher what the terminology or the phrases are supposed to be telling us to do. Exam two is not this Friday, but next Friday, and a few Fridays thereafter, we won't have class. It will be homecoming, and they have an engineer's breakfast, which the graduating seniors are encouraged to attend. What we want to do today, whoops, is not go quite so fast. Get into helping you understand homework number four, we will recap some design specifications. Then we will get into some examples on settling time. You can now take those design specifications both ways. You can use those as design tools to try to determine where you want your closed loop poles to live in the S-plane. If you already have dominant poles in the complex S-plane, you can now go the other direction and say this is what your settling time will be if these are two dominant poles and it's a pure two-pole system. If you have zeros sprinkled around, then that messes things up. But we will at least be able to get some clue as to what's going on with settling time, percent overshoot, and peak time based on these two-pole approximations for a pure two-pole system. And we'll do that in a think-pair-share manner, which means You'll think about or get an answer on your own, then you'll share that with a neighbor or try to come up with a common answer or an answer that you can come to a consensus on, and then I'll call on some team to share their work. And we'll see if we can figure out how to go both forwards and in the other direction with respect to these design specifications. That then leads us naturally into the next piece of some of these issues, which is steady state air. What do we need to know about steady state air and how do we start to gain some appreciation for systems? Maybe these are open loop systems. We're going to close the loop, but it would be nice to be able to infer what's happening in the closed loop based on some open loop information. And that's part of this class is getting comfortable with starting with an open loop transfer function and inferring information about the closed loop from that open loop knowledge or information. Here's some help on homework number four. This is not exactly how the homework is laid out in the problem statement, but I have simply tried to pull the essence into this little 
description, the first part of problem 4.6, how many have already completed homework 4? Maybe I don't even need to do this. I was assuming maybe you hadn't finished homework 4 over the weekend. I was hoping, but I sort of became more realistic last night when I was preparing and I said maybe they haven't yet finished homework number 4, so let's give them some help. Here it's determine the sensitivity of the system to changes in the engine gain K sub E. And the system actually has a couple of inputs. And so what is the system that they're referring to? And you kind of have to know that or be able to understand what the textbook authors are meaning by the system. Well, in this first part, part A, the system means the transfer function between the speed setting R and the speed of your vehicle, it's cut off, I apologize, but you can get all of that on the problems or from the textbook. You want to find that transfer function and then based on that transfer function, which I'm labeling T sub 1, now compute the sensitivity of that transfer function with respect to this parameter K sub E, which is the open loop gain in your vehicle dynamics, K sub E. Is that clear? So in part A, the system refers to the closed loop transfer function between R and V. Once you have that, and that's going to be parameterized in terms of these unknown parameters, K sub E being one of those, now you can perform or compute the sensitivity of that transfer function with respect to that gain K sub E. That's part A. Part B, determine the effect. The effect. What? By that, he, the book is really meaning what's the transfer function. I think you all knew that, but no, maybe not. It's not that clear. So the effect in part B is actually asking you to find another transfer function, which I'm labeling T sub 2. And I'll post these notes, so if you miss something, don't get too nervous. Hopefully I'll get them posted on B2L. But here the effect is the closed loop transfer function between the disturbance input, this delta T sub D, and that's now a load torque. You could sort of think of that as a change in the incline. You're in a car and you're on cruise control, you were on flat and level, and now you're approaching this incline. How is that going to impact your dynamic behavior? The effect in part B is to find simply T sub 2 of S. So find the transfer function, and you can do this. That's why we've learned or tried to become comfortable with block diagram algebra, Mason's gain, et cetera. Question? So in part A, so now the question was in part A, do we assume the load torque is zero? Now you're starting to understand superposition. These are linear systems, superposition applies, and in part A, we aren't worried about the load torque because we're worried about the transfer function between R and V. We don't worry about inputs so much when we're dealing with sensitivity. So we didn't have to apply an input. In part B, it's saying, well, you found one transfer function in A, find a separate transfer function. It's the same system. It's just now you're applying an input in a different location relative to maybe this speed setting. The speed setting now goes into this summing junction, which deals with a controller before you get into the plant or the system which is the engine and the vehicle, the load torque immediately sort of goes into, as an input, that system before it has hit the controller and you're now feeding that information back and using, using your controller to accommodate what's happening in the system. But in part B, the effect is simply that second transfer function. Again, we haven't applied an input yet to this problem. 
We just know where those inputs are located. That's the part B. Part C says determine the constant percent grade. Now what is this load torque value for which this vehicle would actually stall? Let's say you're going at 30, and I can't remember now the units on that 30. Let's just say it's kilometers per hour. You're going 30 kilometers per hour, and you hit a grade. Well, the problem is asking what's how much of a grade can you hit before your engine will stall or will, before your car will stall, which means your velocity is going to go to zero. Now you do need to account for both inputs at the same time. And this is where superposition comes into play. In part C, you're told that the reference input is 30 and it's constant. So in the frequency domain, you have a constant that's 30 over S. That's like a unit step scaled by 30. Again, I don't remember the units on 30, but that's in the problem. But you know it's 30. You are told you want to find this disturbance value. Delta D is just a constant. You need to find that unknown when your vehicle stalls, which says your velocity is zero or your output is zero. Your output is dependent on your reference input and on the disturbance. You've calculated T sub 1 in part A. You've calculated T sub 2 in part B. You're given all the parameters except delta sub D. And delta sub D is just some constant value. What is the slope or the incline that will cause your vehicle to stall or for your vehicle to go to zero in speed. That's the first problem and it's really once you have the inter the terminology or the phrasing down I don't think the processing of that as far as your exercise is that involved. I think the difficult part is interpreting what's being requested for you to solve. Other questions on the first problem? The next problem that you will be asked to look at is problem P4.7. Wow, getting a little too aggressive with my mouse. Again, they ask, what is the effect of T sub D on Y of S? And now you know what they're meaning by the effect. Now they're, you're sort of getting used to that, and you can say, oh, they want the transfer function between the load disturbance input and the output Y, which is now a joint angle. So they want this transfer function, T sub 2, that is between T sub D and Y. And that's the effect in part A of problem 4.7. Then they simply ask you to determine the sensitivity of the closed loop to K sub 2. There's four gains in here, K1, K2, K3, and K4. They want K2 on the, the sensitivity of that on the closed loop, but you could really have two closed loops here. A closed loop between the load disturbance and the angle, or the desired joint angle and the actual joint angle. And they just say determine the sensitivity of the closed loop to K sub 2. In this case, you would need to know that what they mean by the closed loop is T sub 1, which is the transfer function between the reference, the desired joint angle, and the actual joint angle. That's a different transfer function than what you just ca calculated in part A. So in part B, you want T sub 1, and now you can find the sensitivity by computing the sensitivity of T sub 1 with respect to K sub 2. That's part B. And then they want what is the steady state error in your system 
when the desired joint angle is just a constant, 1 over s, that's like a unit step, and the disturbance is 0. So again, you have both inputs, but you're actually setting 1 to 0, and you're just looking at the impact of 1 on the actual angle. The interesting part of part C is that look what's happening in your feedback path. You are not comparing in this summing junction on the far left, you're not comparing the desired joint angle with the actual joint angle directly. You're looking at a scaled version, k sub 3, plus the derivative scaled by k sub 4. So you're not really, this signal coming out of that leftmost summing junction is not an error between the actual and the desired. It's between the, that signal is a difference between the desired and some filtered or modified version of the actual. And so what you want to do in part C is actually define the error to be R minus Y, not that signal coming out of the leftmost summing junction. Question? Why do they exclude the So the question was, why does the closed loop neglect one of the inputs, I think, and the closed loop is what's happening when you do feedback all of your signals to the appropriate places, that now gives you a closed loop. It's not really telling you which inputs or which signals are being applied to the system and where they are being applied. So that's sort of two different ideas. You have a closed loop system, and now in this particular case, and in the last one also, you had a reference input and a disturbance. If you wanted to compute the actual joint angle in the entire system, you would need to include both inputs. We are not worrying so much about that in, as we're stepping through some of these parts of this problem. So it's just a function of what you're interested in, but if you need to know in the real world what's happening with that actual joint angle, you need to do your best to figure out what is my desired joint angle, what's my R, and what is the load disturbance, and incorporate both. They will both be impacting in their own way that joint angle. But if you wanted to look at them individually, and since it's a linear system, we can do that by superposition. We could say set one to zero, look at the impact of the other one, set the other one to zero now, and look at the impact of the original. And then you can sort of decouple the impact or the influence of those two inputs on the output itself. It's really just the way that they're having you walk through the problem. Then in one of the other problems, problem 5.6, this is now, I, I don't remember if they're painting or if they're cutting or if they're welding, but they're moving a robot arm in this triangular pattern and they want to know, or they are interested in the steady state air. And this is maybe what you're asking. This is the reference signal. You're saying go up basically at a 45 degree angle and then go down and then go up and go down. Where's my steady state air? <laughs> I keep switching directions. What's going to happen? That's now the reference input signal. But now you have to keep in mind how quickly your system is responding to those requests to change directions. And here is one illustration of that. The dashed curve is the reference. That's where you would like to be. The blue solid curve is maybe where you actually are. But look how quickly you sort of reach a steady state and you're able to track. Now you're not locked on, 
but you are at least tracking that reference or that dashed line with a small error. And the error, once you, so if you're, maybe I need to allow for those people that are playing along at home. If you now are asking your system to go there, you can see that in pretty short order, our transient has disappeared. And now from this point onward, you could sort of say, oh, you're now in a steady state condition. Is that clear? And that's where your, so your transient is shorter than the time horizon that you're asking your system to move along. So this particular trajectory is not the same as the earlier one in your problem. Your problem, you're going that direction for 10 units of time, and then you go down again, but the idea is the same. Is that clear? So essentially, we're playing on that notion of infinity. Infinity is not that long. Infinity is four or five time constants, and that's not that long in this illustration. We now go from zero to two, and maybe in less than one, we are at steady state. And that's what you'll have to keep in mind. But if you look at this, the steady state error, maybe it has a different sign, S-I-G-N, but it's going to be the same magnitude for these different parts of your requested trajectory that you're wanting to follow. Is that clear? So you can assume that you've reached steady state, even though you're not going to infinity in real time, you're going beyond five time constants, and now what's your steady state here? And that's where we want to get to, and here's some MATLAB code that you can try to understand that is really just allowing them to sketch or to plot that above figure. Let's now return to where we finished last time, which was design specifications. Again, we're wanting to connect design specifications with steady state error. Design specifications are concerned with transient behavior, and one of those was settling time. Again, these specifications are all based on a pure two-pole system, and do we remember what I mean by pure? No finite zeros. And in these problems throughout the semesters, occasionally we're going to have some zeros. So then you'll have to sort of take these design specs with a grain of salt. They're not hard and fast. These are just rules that help us get a feel for where we want our poles to live or to lie in the complex S-plane. They're not necessarily going to be exact, especially when we have 10 different poles floating around and maybe some zeros, but maybe the overall effect is that you can sort of aggregate all of that into something that's like a dominant two-pole system. Our 2% settling time, we're using four time constants to represent that. And we really know that four time constants gives us a 1.8 something but percent, but we're approximating that to be 2%. Our tau, our time constant, is now reciprocally related to sigma. And where I'm already giving you hand signals, so I'm directing your thought. And you can be mentally thinking about this. Where do you, is sigma in the S plane? What are you imagining when you say 4 over sigma? It's the distance we are into the left half plane, isn't it? But we usually refer to sigma as just a positive number, but we're actually going into the left half plane, and sigma tells us this distance 
we are into the left half plane. And if we want a faster settling time or a smaller T sub S, maybe somebody says, I want your settling time to be a half of a second. And maybe your system originally was settling in two seconds. What does, how does that translate into sigma? You need to go further into the left half plane, don't you? if you want a faster or a smaller settling time. So in this case, we want a larger sigma, and we would be over here for a smaller T sub S. And here you might have to really be awake on the exams, because I might just turn that completely around. I might say, I want your settling time to be slower. Then you know that you can now start sliding that vertical line closer to the imaginary axis. Is that clear? But typically we want to speed up our response, which says we want to move further and further into the left half plane. Can you think of a reason why your boss might say, don't put your poles at minus a million, I know it's going to be fast. Why would your boss not want you to put them at clear out at minus a million? If it's better. So now if you are moving your poles, you're doing this with feedback, is there some, it might be too costly, it may be too difficult, your poor system might not want to respond that fast either. It maybe can't physically. And now you have bent the arm, the robot arm, because you tried to move it too fast or you overstressed that particular system. So there are trade-offs that you have to keep in mind, although we can kind of be in our ivory tower and say, oh, we just need to go faster. Let's just keep going. No, you, you need to make sure you're not going too far into the left half plane. Is that clear? All right, what was our other one? We had percent overshoot design specification. And here you can either keep track of this zeta percent overshoot equation, which don't forget the square root. That's a common mistake on the exam is, oh, I forgot to take the square root of the whole thing. Or you can simply have figure 5.8 on your crib sheet. That's fine. And that gives you this relationship between your percent overshoot and zeta. And what are some values of percent overshoot and zeta that you might kind of want to have burned into your brain for the next three months? 5% corresponds to what zeta value? 0.7, doesn't it? And now if you remember your trig, what does that relative or mean in terms of an angle? The inverse cosine of 0 0.7 is 45 degrees, 0 0.707. So this is now like 45 degrees if you were thinking of theta. And now think of this wedge, either a pizza wedge or a pie wedge, some wedge in the complex S-plane, what's this 10% overshoot corresponding to for zeta, approximately? Do you remember? Did we say that last time? Pardon? 53 degrees, correct, which was 0.6 for zeta. So this is now, in terms of degrees, that's a bigger angle. And now, in terms of the picture, if we wanted, or if we make that wedge smaller, the angle smaller, if we're now staying in here with our desired dominant poles, what's that doing to our percent overshoot? 
it's decreasing it or making it less, isn't it? So now we have less overshoot as we squeeze those poles down relative to this angle theta. And now you might want to push them further out for settling time. You may want to squeeze them for percent overshoot. We have one more design spec that we were playing with, and that's this peak time. Peak time we derive to be time to peak is pi over omega sub d. Or omega sub d is pi over time to peak. And now what kind of a image are you seeing in the S-plane? Omega sub d? That's the damped frequency of oscillation. Now that's your vertical distance, isn't it? So if you have a vertical jump, Just keep writing, don't be looking. What are you seeing now? Now hopefully you are seeing here is this distance omega sub d. And if you want a quicker or a smaller time to peak, what does that mean as far as omega sub d? Which way do you want to go? Do you want to be below that line or compact it, make omega sub d smaller, or do you want to make omega sub d further? Do you want to get further away from the real line to have a quicker time to peak? We need to be up here, don't we? So this we need to increase omega sub d. And I think at the end of last time we ran out of time, and so after class I actually sketched the intersection of those. Now you could have all three design specs playing at the same time. You may have to have a certain peak time. That tells you where you are relative to your vertical distance. You may have to be a certain distance into the S-plane, in the left half S-plane for settling time. And you may want to squeeze those poles down so that you don't have that big of a percent overshoot. And you now have to satisfy all three of those design specs simultaneously. Let's just play with one for now. 2% settling time, T sub S. And we're playing with this unity output feedback. Unity means a gain of one, and it's output, and usually that is implying negative feedback. So it's negative unity output feedback. Our input, R of S, is a unit step, which means it looks like what in the S domain? Capital R of S equals 1 over S. Now, what I want you to do on your own is compute for this system, G of S, the 2% settling time. Tell me what it's going to be. And it should take you a minute or less. For this configuration, unity output feedback, tau naught is 1, k naught is 10. What's your 2% settling time? many have an answer? It's 
not very many hands going up. Maybe you need to loosen up. Okay, compare that with your neighbor and see if you're all on the same page. Did you get the same answer? So now you're sharing your answer with your neighbor. Don't try this on an exam, but today this is fine. So you've already thought about it. Now share it because I'm going to call on somebody. So this is think, pair. Now you're pairing up to compare answers. And then you're going to share with the rest of the class what you came up with. Everybody convinced that they have the correct answer? Who wants to share? Do I have a volunteer that's brave enough? Yes. Four? Where did that come from? So now T sub S is four times four time constants, right? And this is four over sigma. And tau, well, am I tricking you? Tau here for G is the open loop system's time constant, isn't it? I want you to find the closed loop system's settling time. So now, Tau not being one, if we just had the open loop system, this would be a stable system, wouldn't it? This would be, if we just, if we disconnected the feedback, then we would have four seconds for our settling time. Four over one. So now, we need to start this, we have to compute our closed loop transfer function, don't we? Between R and Y. What's our closed loop transfer function? That's the cheer, and we need more cheers throughout the rest of the semester, right? G over 1 plus GH, and H is 1. G is our open loop system transfer function. If we compute T of S, Got a lot of T's going around. I've got a tau, I've got a tau naught, I've got a T sub S, I've got a T. But here, capital T of S, I'm saying is my closed loop transfer function. That's the G over 1 plus GH with H equal to 1. This was now K naught over tau naught S plus 1 over 1 plus K naught tau naught S plus 1, where the knots are for the open loop gain and time constant. If we clean that up, get just a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial, we end up with K naught over tau naught S plus 1 plus K naught. Is that making sense? Now what's our closed loop pole? And, and here, wait a minute. You said a pure two-pole system. Is this a, what kind of a system do we have here? This is first order, isn't it? But it still has a sigma, doesn't it? It still has a distance into the left half plane. So that now, whoa, I'm running out of space. I can cheat, can't I? Now, this is a first order, but we can still say, well, we have a denominator 
which if we find the values of s that cause that to vanish, those will be our closed loop holes. And in this case, it's just one. And we had tau naught was one, k naught was 10, so that now we have, in terms of a denominator, we have s plus one plus 10 equaling zero, or s is equal to minus 11. which now says there is our sigma, isn't it? That's how far we are into the left half plane. Now if somebody says, oh, 4 tau or 4 over sigma, that's 4 over 11, isn't it? And what is 4 over 11? Somebody calculate it. Point three six three six. Is that okay? So that is our settling time. Thirty six or three hundred and sixty three milliseconds. A little less than half of a second, which is much different than the open loop, isn't it? The open loop would have been four seconds. Now we've sped it up by feeding back, and that gain of 10 has helped push that pole further into the left half plane. Now we have a 0.36 second settling time, 2% settling time. Is that clear? Now let's try it again. Find the settling time now. Now we've reduced the gain and we've reduced the time constant. Time constant now is 0.1 and the gain is 1. And this is knotted. These are the open loop transfer functions. Hint, hint, right? So again, this is G of S, and we want the closed loop 2% settling time. Everybody have an answer? Now what's our closed loop transfer function? Or maybe I should just ask you, what's the settling time? 0 0.2 seconds. So now the gain is less, our time constant, our open loop system is much faster, isn't it? And we fed back, we now have it in a closed loop. This now I think you found from T being G over 1 plus G. If we go through the math there, we have 1 over 0 0.1 S plus 1 plus 1. And now that's giving us this 1 over 0 0.1 plus 2. Whoops, needs to be an S in there. And now our pole is moved out further, isn't it? So now we would expect this to be faster than part A. Is that clear? And our settling time now from this, this is now minus sigma, so that T sub S is 4 over sigma. So that's 4 over 20. Is that right? And now this gives us our one-fifth, which is 0 0.2. Is that clear? All right, one more. Now here's a plant, G of S. 1 over S times S plus 1. And that last one, the middle one, was 
first order also, wasn't it? But we could still find its real part. Now what do we have? Second order. But we're still putting this into a closed loop configuration. get an answer. What was the settling time for this guy? Pardon? Eight seconds. Boy, this guy's kind of slow, isn't it? This system. Where did that come from? Did everyone get a closed loop transfer function like that? So that now the denominator is s squared plus s plus 2. Is that right? No. s squared plus s plus 1. So that now we can say, well, I could get that s squared plus s by squaring that. And then I just need to find what I need to fill in to complete the square to get 1 back. And 1 is going to make be made up of 1 fourth plus 3 fourths, and I want to square that so that now I have this s plus 1 half squared plus the square root of 3 over 2 squared. There are my poles. They're at minus 1 half plus and minus j squared to 3 over 2. But what's critical or what's important in that complex pole pair? What's the key number? The one half, the sigma, the distance into the left half plane. So that sigma being one half, now we can say T sub S is four time constants or four over sigma. That's now four over one half or eight seconds. That's now how we get our settling times. Now, what are your thoughts on steady state air? Which system of those three, AI, AII, or B, if you were playing along and following my notation, first, second, and third, which of those has the best or the smallest steady state error and which has the largest? And I would like, well, you to be able to tell me. Answer one, two, three, four, five, or six. Which one's the best, 
steady state air and which one's the worst steady state air? Four. Do we want to have a show of hands? How many think the pairing number one, that the very first system is the best and the second middle system had the worst steady, or will have the worst steady state air? Who thinks it's one? Maybe I should have you all answer with a finger or fingers. We have just six possibilities, right? I know I'm not giving you much time to do this, but show of fingers. One, two, and when I say three, I want you to vote with your finger, okay? So nobody is influenced by their neighbor necessarily. So you can either do a one, a two, a four, a five, a six, which is which? Is everybody comfortable with what we're doing? I apologize, we are out of time, but we'll keep going. This is so fun. All right, one, two, three. Fours, a lot of fours. All right, we'll come back next time and figure out which has the better steady state air and why.